So this lighting might be better because um, I think the last one it looked like I had a glare on the side of my face. So hopefully this one, even though there's the window in the background, will be uh, um, particularly a little bit easier to watch. Because I know that you all probably love watching these, so I'm just full of jokes today. Uh, Alright. So, as we actually get into Kantian philosophy and Kantian thought here, a couple of things that recall with Hume, and what I'm going to do a lot uh, in these lectures today is I'm going to focus in uh, on some distinctions between Hume and Kant, because as we do that, ultimately, um, ultimately what we will find is that, that uh, hopefully those ideas will be a little bit more concrete and a little bit more clear. Okay. So, as you can see here uh, on your lecture notes here, uh, the concepts are in terms at the onset. And, and I'm going to skip down to the second uh, clear point right here, the, the a posteriori. Okay? And we had talked about that on Monday with regards to Hume, that for Hume, all of our knowledge, uh, when we think about epistemology and we think about what it is we know, how it is we know it, do we know anything at all? Hume says, yeah, we know lots of stuff. How do we know lots of stuff? We know a lot of stuff through uh, empiricism, through our ability um, and through through empirical um, observation, right? Through experience. And the fancy philosophical word for that is called a posteriori. A post, after the fact, after... Um, um, yeah, after the fact. That all of our knowledge is derived from experience, all our knowledge is derived from the empirical. Now, for Kant, he is going to focus on the a priori, a priori, of knowledge that is prior to an experience. And you might think to yourself, well, what does that mean? How can somebody have knowledge prior to an experience? Well, under Kantian terms, and how he understood this, is that it's knowledge derived independent of experience, perhaps from the mind itself, from our ability to reason. From our ability to reason. That Kant will say, and, and he'll, he'll make claims as we kind of work, um, 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 as we work through, through his philosophy today, that, that throughout it, reason, our ability to be rational, much like Aristotle, is kind of the foundational um, aspect of our morality. That when we really kind of exercise our ability to reason, when we think about um, the power of reason, we can know how it is we ought to act. Okay? That we know a lot of things um, independent of experience, Kant will claim. Okay? And that leads down here to this next, uh, the next kind of focus here. That for Kant, for Kant, he is focusing heavily on this notion of the is-ought distinction. The is-ought distinction. And I've used some of these phrases throughout the course of our couple of weeks together, but in particular, what he has in mind here is that when we think about it, we have the is, okay, we have the is, like what is the case? But if we very quickly kind of change that question around and we ask ourselves, what ought to be the case? Perhaps we would get a lot of different answers. Okay. There are descriptive facts about the world. What is the case? There is murder. There is rape. There is war. But, when we turn that question to the ought, right, something very powerful changes, or something very, um, uh, something changes very powerfully, rather, right? Ought there be murder? Ought there be rape? Ought there be war? When we change those questions to the ought, perhaps we're led to very different engagement with those questions. Because very clearly, right, very clearly we say, no, there ought not be murder. Very clearly, no, there ought not be rape. Very clearly, there ought not be war. 
granted, maybe war is, is more of a, of, of a difficult question, um, given uh, geopolitical structures and, and such like that, right? But nevertheless, if these, these very dramatic you know, instances of murder, rape, molestation, stealing, right? Things that we would very clearly deem immoral. Well, why is it the case? Why is it the case that they still exist? Hmm? So given that, presumably all of these answers to these questions will be no, then how can we change our behavior? When we think about what is the case and what ought to be the case. And so Kant starts with this, this fundamental, um, fundamental uh, premise, this fundamental foundation here of the is-ought. On a much lighter note, if you hear a little bit of a bell jingling in the background, I I have a small, tiny cat um, who's the best in the whole wide world, and she's taking inventory of, of her toys. So, um, and that includes various bells and things. So, um, yeah, she also might saunter to and fro the living room into the kitchen where uh, her food is. So, anyway, um, she's very, very stern uh, and, and uh, uh, fierce beast. So keep your eyes peeled. <laughs> All right. Back to Kant. So thinking about it from kind of this is-ought question, which is, again, kind of the starting premise for Kant, that, again, he thinks that we can have, again, knowledge, a priori knowledge, to that ought question. That I can have knowledge independent of experience about a lot of things, including questions such as is ought. I, I, I don't need to go out and murder someone to know that I ought not do it. That elucidated through reason, through my ability to make these rational justifications, these rational judgments, I can reasonably uh, deduce and arrive at perhaps moral truths. Right? And those moral truths being that I don't need to go out and, and like I said, murder someone, experience in it firsthand to know that I ought not do it. And the same goes with the other list that I had said. Okay? And that's one of Kant's major focuses here. That we can have a lot of knowledge about a lot of um, moral quandaries, moral decisions that we don't necessarily need to experience, but yet we can still have knowledge. Now, some of the language that we're going to get into is confusing because it's translated from German. Um, also, it's just it's Kant, and Kant's confusing. Um, so as, as we kind of work through some of this language, just be patient, um, and hopefully by the end of these lectures, we'll have an idea, we'll have an understanding um, of, of, of what it is he's saying, what it is he's claiming. Um, yeah. But just, just bear, bear with the notion that, that this might be um, confusing. So we have this is-ought question as kind of the foundation of, of, um, of, of where Kant will work from. Okay? And with regards to morality, Kant bases everything in the, in, in the good will. And again, this is a weird kind of concept. It's a weird um, um, language, but, but bear with me here. That for Kant, everything uh, is based in the goodwill. Okay? And the goodwill, he claims, is good without qualification. Now, what does that mean? Basically, to assume and to understand what the goodwill has in mind, we can understand it in terms of... of um, Intentions. That for Kant, intentions matter. And this is interesting. When we focus on our intentions, uh, well, rather, pardon me, we appeal to our intentions all of the time, right? Especially perhaps when it does come to moral decisions. That when we make claims where we say, oh, it wasn't my intention to do this, it wasn't my intention to harm that person to do that thing, right? It was an accident. 
meaning that I'm appealing to not necessarily, um, you know, what my, my focus was, what my, my clear-cut decisions were, but rather, right, it was an accident that I spilled coffee on my roommate's computer. It wasn't my intention. Okay. So how can I be held responsible for that action when I didn't mean to do it? And then your roommate will come back and say, well, you spilled coffee on my laptop, so you have to pay for my repairs or my laptop, right? But we do this all the time. We focus in on our intentions. And so Kant thinks that that's the right way to think about morality. That it's not necessarily outcomes that matter, but rather it's intentions. Where do our actions stem from? They stem from our intentions. And I'm kind of pointing, you know, to my chest, uh, to my heart, because maybe that's where my brain, right, from reason, right? But from inward somewhere, stemming outward uh, into the world, okay? That it is that my intentions matter. And so the goodwill, Kant thinks, that if we kind of frame and focus our goodwill in such a way where we can kind of uh, attempt to always do good, and again, we'll get to how this all pieces together here in a little bit, that ultimately with that, that, that when we have the right intentions, then we will also be better suited for the right outcome. Okay. And a little anecdote to this, and then we'll, we'll pause this video and move to the next one. Uh, but a little anecdote to this is, let's say you have some friends that, that, ask, you to, uh, that ask you to house sit for them. Okay. And you say, okay, that's fine. I can, I can do that. Right? And they've got a dog, they've got a handful of plants, and you say, okay, yeah, no problem. I'll go over, I'll take care of the dog, take care of the plants. You know, I'm just doing what it is I think I ought to do with regards to being a good house sitter. And so you go over to the house, you water the plants, you take the dog out, you feed the dog, etc., blah, 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 blah. You do this for a couple of days. And then, ultimately, the day before your friends come back, you look at the weather report, and it looks like it's going to be really, really cold when they come back. And so again, thinking, you know, well, I'm, I'm, you know, you know, I'm going to turn up the heat a couple of degrees in their house, so it's a little bit more comfortable for the dog. It's a little bit more um, conducive for the plants, right? We don't want the plants to freeze. Blah blah blah. blah. Kind of just doing what it is you think you ought to do with regards to being a good house sitter. You turn up the heat. Hello. All right. Sorry. Uh, screen went dark. Uh, you turn up the heat in the house just a couple of degrees. And, you know, you go on your merry way. Well, lo and behold, lo and behold, unfortunately, doing that, turning up the heat a couple of degrees in their house, sparked an electrical fire, and you burn their house down. The dog escapes. The dog's fine. Don't worry about it. Very important. But nevertheless, you... You burnt their house down from that decision of turning up the heat in their house. Again, what you're going to do probably is you're probably going to appeal to your intentions, right? Because your intentions were such where you weren't trying to do any sort of malicious behavior, or weren't trying to cause harm, you weren't trying to burn their house down, right? But rather, your intentions were such that they were good. They were born from the goodwill, from acting within your capacity to reason, to think about, all right, well, how is it that I ought to act? You know, it would be really lovely, um, you know, uh, if, 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 uh, if somebody was house-sitting for me, that if, if they turned up the heat in my house, um, you know, to, to be, be um, safe for my dog and my plants, right? So I'm going to do the same. So you do it, and you accidentally burn their house down. So now you and your friends have this very kind of troubling, uncomfortable um, probably multiplicity of conversations of, of responsibility, right? Whose responsibility was it? Faulty wiring, um, it was all obviously accidental, but nevertheless, you were the one that made that decision, right? So when we think about our actions, Kant wants to kind of gear our attention to, to how those intentions matter. And ultimately, under that house-sitting example, you are not held morally responsible under a Kantian perspective because your intentions were such that they were not, uh, they were not focused on doing harm. Okay. 
So with that in mind and kind of keeping that kind of as part of this, this, this block where we have the is-ought distinction, now we have intentions, now we're going to see uh, where else it is we go.